Unrest is a Sundance and Boston Globe award-winning film and has been shortlisted for an Oscar. This event raised awareness about a disease largely forgotten by the medical community, ME, myalgic encephalomyelitis, also known as CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome. There are approximately 21 to 52,000 Massachusetts residents, 1 to 2.5 million Americans, and 17 to 20 million people around the globe disabled by ME many homebound and bedridden. This event was groundbreaking. For the first time, a State Department of Public Health in the U.S. hosted and co-organized, along with a state advocacy organization, a program focused on ME. Approximately 140 people attended, including public health and healthcare professionals, scientists, researchers, epidemiologists, analysts, and school nurses. This video includes everything from the event except the film which is widely available elsewhere. It's a real pleasure for us to host this film tonight. I think it's a great opportunity for the Department of Public Health. And uh, you know, I think we, we have to recognize that uh, the disease we're going to be considering tonight has been around for a very long time. I think a lot of people think it suddenly appeared in the 1980s. But in point of fact, there's evidence that this goes back well over 100 years. Uh, and certainly in the 20th century, uh, in terms of sporadic cases uh, and outbreaks, uh, what was called in 1955 at the Royal Free Hospital in London, myalgic encephalomyelitis has been uh, going on for, for a long time. And uh, manifests in a, in a lot of symptoms that people have in terms of post-exertional malaise, orthostatic hypotension, um, uh, a variety of endocrine and immunologic issues that arise. Uh, and the movie that you're going to see tonight, the documentary that you're going to see, is uh, an example of a very uh, severe case of MECFS that we're now calling it uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis and fatigue syndrome. Um, and this condition occurs uh, in a broad spectrum of disease. So people uh, can have severe disease, like you'll see tonight in the film, but they can also have milder forms of this. But despite the spectrum of disease, despite the um, difference in severity, uh, one thing that we know patients with MECFS face is difficulty getting the kind of care that they need to, to get. Because many clinicians, um, it's embarrassing to say, some clinicians don't believe this exists, even though you know, everything we know about it tells us it exists, including the National Institutes of Health and the <coughs> Centers for Disease Control. Uh, and many, many uh, providers, healthcare providers, feel uh, incapable of dealing with it and not knowing what to do with it. And that is a function of the fact that this disease doesn't have a distinct laboratory result that defines it as a diagnosis. And uh, that's sometimes difficult to deal with because everybody wants you know, some objective sign. And um, if the objective sign doesn't exist, maybe the disease doesn't exist. And, so uh, people with MECFS face those kinds of issues and difficulties in getting the care they need. Uh, and I think that uh, the film tonight uh, will, will give you an idea of how severe this condition can be and how difficult it can be to deal with. Uh, and again, uh, you know, I think uh, some reaction to this film so far has suggested that people are overwhelmed by the severity of gem uh, disease. But again, it's part of a spectrum. There's a spectrum uh, from as severe as this to less severe, but nonetheless, in many cases, having a big impact on people's life, lifestyle, and ability uh, to function. So uh, again, we're very pleased that the Department of Health can sponsor this 
film tonight, and I'm going to turn it over to Rifta Solomon, who's going to take over. Alan's been a longtime friend of um, Mass Seafits Association. So as I said, I'm Rifka Solomon. I'm with Mass Seafits. And I have been waiting 28 years for this event. I've been waiting 28 years for all of you to be gathered here tonight in this room with me to learn about myalgic encephalomyelitis. That's because for much of those 28 years, I have been homebound and <coughs> without the basic strength and bodily energy and cognitive ability to function on a very basic level, all because I have ME. So this event is groundbreaking. It's the first time the State Department of Health has hosted and sponsored an event for ME. And tonight is groundbreaking for one other reason. Uh, for the remarkable people who are in this room, I want to tell you who you are. You are public health officials, physicians, pediatricians, health directors from towns across Massachusetts, directors of health services from schools across the state. You're researchers, scientists, data scientists, attorneys, school nurses, public health nurses, and nurse practitioners. Nurses in the house. <laughs> genetic counselors, epidemiologists, a lot of epidemiologists. You are professors, you are a professor of pharmacology, a molecular supervisor, a state nutritionist, you're on the board of health for your town, you're an editor of a prestigious medical journal, you're a research analyst, a tumor analyst, and a bacteriologist. Not bad. When some of the 17 to 20 million people across the globe with ME hear that you are in this room watching this film with us, this impressive group, they will literally weep in relief, knowing that you are here to finally break their isolation, finally hear what their lives are like, tethered to their beds, unable to leave their homes because they're too sick for years on end. We have an exciting panel. Uh, Jen Brea, the filmmaker, is going to be with us tonight. Ron Davis, a world-renowned Stanford University genealogist. Faith Newton, a national expert on ME, young people with ME in the schools. Lisa Hall, RN, a healthcare professional with 17 years experience treating ME. And we have a wonderful panel moderator. I'm thrilled that our panel moderator is Deborah Becker, senior correspondent and host at WBUR. Boston's National Public Radio Station. I told Deborah yesterday, I think of her as the embodiment of calm intelligence, and we're lucky to have her. Slide two. Facts about ME. Myalgic encephalomyelitis is commonly known as chronic fatigue syndrome, although tonight we will hear that most patients reject that term, chronic fatigue syndrome, because fatigue does not come anywhere near close to accurately describing the devastation that this disease brings. It's a multi-system disease that results in a host of life-degrading symptoms, including neurological abnormalities and an energy production impairment so severe that you can end up too debilitated to do ordinary tasks such as brush your teeth, make a salad, or talk on the phone. There's an estimated one to two and a half million Americans afflicted, 75% are women, no diagnostic test, no FDA approved treatment, no cure. 25% are homebound and bedridden, as I am much of the time. 80 to 90% are not even diagnosed or they're misdiagnosed. Fewer than a dozen medical specialists around the country are available to treat ME. And symptoms typically persist for years on end. Recovery is rare. As you heard, I've had this for 28 years. ME costs the US economy 17 to 24 billion annually. And NIH research is low, very, very low. Historically, about $5 million a year. It's that barely visible line at the far end of that chart right there. <laughs> the good news is that last year, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, started to fund three research centers around the US, but the amount that they gave for the effort is still minuscule compared to the need. There's so much more needed. Who we are, the Massachusetts CFIDS Association is the longest running state organization in the country. We were founded in 1985. We offer education such as screenings, and we're happy to come to your venue 
Um, we also offer patient support and advocacy. With the NIH responding to this disease with a, uh, this public health problem, with a lack of urgency and a lack of seriousness uh, to the problem that is present, we decided that we needed to start focusing more on congressional help. We secured Senator Ed Markey as a champion for ME on Capitol Hill. His first act as our champion was to hold a congressional briefing about ME on Capitol Hill. And we've also now secured my congressman, Congressman Jim McGovern in Western Massachusetts as a champion for ME. And then a few months ago, we did something groundbreaking. And that's what you see on the slide. We secured a joint statement of support from the entire Massachusetts congressional delegation saying they will help us push for expanded biomedical research opportunities and funding in Congress. We now hope to leverage these words of support into something more concrete and tangible. And on that successful note, here's Unrest, the film that was shortlisted for an Oscar and has been changing lives around the globe. I would like to introduce our panel moderator. It is my absolute distinct pleasure to introduce Deborah Becker. She is senior correspondent and host at WBUR, Boston's national public radio station, and she is a wonderful human being, and I'm so thrilled to have her here. Welcome, everyone, and uh, welcome, Ron. Uh, thank you all for coming. I guess there's some interest in this. We have almost a full house. I'm told that this is the first time that a state public health department has put on a screening of the film and offered a panel about this to provide more information to healthcare professionals like yourself. So uh, kudos to Massachusetts. So, so first we'll, we'll introduce uh, our panelists one at a time and let them ask a couple of questions. Jen Rea. We don't really need to introduce her to us. We just talk a little more about getting you ever started. <laughs> <laughs> just watched an awful lot about your life. And, and can we applaud again? Yeah. Congratulations on doing all this work and, and bringing awareness uh, to this. But I'm wondering, here you are, in a room full of a hundred or so, maybe more healthcare professionals. What would you say to them directly? This was a film for a general audience. What would you say to the folks in this room who are looking for some guidance about doing this? So, I mean, I, I guess you've seen the film, and it's, it, it was really meant to be uh, an intimate and experiential journey into um, this world that I never knew existed and would never have known that existed. Um, how to walk off the stick myself. Um, raise your hand here if this was surprising or different than what you had known before about this condition. So, yeah, thank you. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think the thing that, um, and in some ways, this is, this is your profession, this is your expertise, and this is a multi-dimensional problem, and, and it is absolutely a public health problem. It's a public health problem in the sense that you know, not only is there um, you know, a massive amount of awareness of the, of the disease and of what uh, patients with this face, um, you know, just trying to access care, um, but also trying to access any kind of service, whether it's, you know, we have to fight harder to get disability benefits, there are housing issues, there are issues related to caregiving, issues related to, to help access care if, if you can't even leave your home. Um, and so I'm hoping that this place inspires people to think a little bit about the different ways that you might be able to intersect sort of think of this in a holistic way um, as, a, as a public health issue. Um, I had no idea that this disease even existed, let alone that it was possible to get this sick this young. And I, I had, um, uh, you know, we did a screening from medical school last night, which was really thrilling, and it was so hopeful and inspiring to um, talk to medical students who are just the beginning of their um, careers and their lives um, you know, on the way to becoming physicians. And they were so curious and so open. And I talked to first year students and talked to third year students. And so many of them said to me, um, you know, not only is this disease not in our curriculum, but we 
we learn so little about pain management, about chronic illness, about autoimmune disease in general. Um, everything, we're learning about these really fascinating rare diseases and about you know, all of this acute stuff, but like this thing where it, it, it isn't always so clear how to intervene and you need the time with the patient. We're just not learning about this. And so I think there's a lot more we have to do um, to, I think if we can invest in this disease and investing more into helping people living with it, it's actually going to help reveal gaps that exist in our public health infrastructure for people living with a wide range of chronic illnesses. And so um, I hope that that has been conveyed through the film and that we can start a conversation here about what we can do for people uh, living with any in Massachusetts and who are affected by similar types of issues. You know, you mentioned stigma um, as being an issue, and I'm, I'm wondering what would you say to folks here about stigma and, and stigma. addressing that? I think for a long time it's been an incredibly difficult condition to have because you get sick and you disappear and then there's just no way to explain this to your friends and family. And a part of it is because either you get so sick that you literally end up you know, homebound in a dark room 24-7 and the people who were once a part of your lives no longer see you. And so there's that type of disappearing. And then I also think there's the visibility of the disease that is about um, the way that it is, it is, it is variable and, and deceptive. So, you know, um, I'm here, um, I'm sitting kind of funny because of my, of my orthostatic intolerance. Um, but other than that, you would probably think that I'm a totally, you know, healthy, um, you, know, you know, normal adult. And you, you don't see the fact that I was resting all day in order to be here. You don't see what this trip will do to me when I fly back home to Los Angeles. And so in these little slivers of my life that you see either out in a public space like this or for those of us who can work at work um, uh, or in, in that kind of you know, very small room in a doctor's office, you don't see what we pay in order to try to be a part of the world to keep going. Um, so at the best, in the best, best case scenario, I think that there are people who you know, are, are working full time, barely hanging on, need accommodations that aren't getting them, and have to spend their evenings and their weekends recovering or to able to make it back to work on the next Monday. Um, and because if you're working, you do not want any much to know that you have, you have this. And because if you're, if you're on severe end, no one knows you even exist. There's this weird kind of invisibility at every level. And I think for a long time, you know, a shame about having something that is hard to convey, uh, an experience that you can only really understand if you live at home. And, um, and so I think one of the things that the film has helped to do is to give people a way to sort of not just tell their story, we've been telling our stories for decades, um, you know, in the media, in doctor's offices, but to show their story. Um, and so I think that that has helped more people to kind of come out, and it really does feel like a kind of coming out, a kind of saying, you know, I'm not going to be essentially silent anymore by the perception of this disease as one that is um, quote, not real, or quote, in your head, or, or, or something that is not, isn't, isn't serious. Um, and so I do think that a part of our work is really helping people to get diagnosed. It's a huge crisis in diagnosis, 80% are not diagnosed. To get diagnosed, to get access to adequate care, and to, to find community um, so that they can get the support that they need, and also a sense of, um, you know, I, mean, I would call it pride, I mean, I'm so, I do not want this disease. Um, I want to find a cure, but I'm so proud of the people who I thought I had a chance to meet and want to fight for Great, thank you. I'll um, open it up for questions after we, we talk to Ron because he's still with us, and, and that's great. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit of his bio here. Uh, Ron Davis is a professor of biochemistry and genetics at Stanford University. He's also director of the Stanford Genome Technology Center, director of the CFS <coughs> Research Center at Stanford, and a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the Scientific Advisory Board Director of Open Medicine Foundation. And of course, Dr. Davis's son, as we saw in Jen's film, uh, has a severe Emmy. Ron, thanks so much for being with us. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. How is your son? I think he's getting uh, uh, a bit better because he's, uh, he's shifting his schedule to waking up earlier. Right. Well, well um, I hope that I hope it's okay. Um, uh, you you just got a five million dollar Bitcoin donation, right, for the Open Medicine Foundation? Is that right? Uh, we we received a substantial uh, number of, of donations recently. 
and uh, that's caused us a great deal of excitement. Um, and we're not, we're now sort of planning what we're going, how we're going to use the money. We have to be very careful that we don't uh, use the money on things that are are not necessarily going to pay off. Uh, and so there's a lot of strategy planning. Uh, our our major major effort is to try to develop a, a, a biomarker, and we actually have four different ones that are showing great promise. Uh, one of them is something we call a nanonatal, and uh, every CFS patient shows a positive signal in this assay, and none of the healthy controls do. So that's a better marker so far than, than seen, uh, I think, in any other system. Uh, we have three others that we're also pursuing. They're a little, uh, we have less, less data on that. From a researcher's perspective, can you tell us what you think is happening in many of the folks who have ME? What are you seeing physically that's going on? How are you describing it? Well, I, I, I think it's a uh, systemic disease. And we certainly see uh, a lot of hypometabolic reaction, that is, uh, a large number of the metabolites are, are low. And, and Robert Navio has done an excellent job. We've also looked at uh, the metabolites, and we, we concur with what Robert Navio sees. Uh, a lot of the lipids are affected in this disease. And that's something that we're now pursuing pretty heavily. Uh, we also see a, a large number of mutations that are probably affecting the patients. And some of them, I think, are, are probably causing some of their symptoms. Uh, every patient has a different collection of mutations. And so it could account easily for all of the varied uh, symptoms that patients are experiencing. Uh, there is a tendency to want to uh, group these into different uh, categories of disease. Uh, my suspicions are there are as many categories as there are patients, and therefore it's not a very useful thing to do. Uh, we will come out with a fairly large study soon from severely ill patients, and we have a large number of other patients that we're putting together. Uh, that's a, a family study where we look at patients and everybody in the family. Um, many of these families we're looking at have multiple affected, but they also have healthy people. And comparing the healthy people in the family with the patients has been quite instructive uh, because they share a lot of genetics and they share the same environment and they share the same diet. So I, I'm hoping that that will uh, point us in the right direction. But we do believe that some sort of systemic uh, problem, probably at some central control circuit. And it's a matter of trying to find what is that central control circuit that, that's, uh, that's messed up in some way. We think there's something going on that locks the patients into this, and they can't get out of it. So if we can figure out what that control circuit is, uh, we may have a strategy to unlock it. That's our major effort at the moment. Uh, because that would possibly mean that we don't need to develop a drug. Uh, that there, may, uh, there may be ways to manipulate that central circuit to get people out of the disease. Uh, we have one primary circuit that we're looking at at the moment. Uh, we should figure out whether that's right by the end of the summer. The end of this summer? So, so what would your advice be to a room full of healthcare professionals here in Boston? What would you tell them as, as they potentially work with patients who, who may have the disease? I think right now what the healthcare professionals should do is treat symptoms and listen to the patients. Uh, you have to listen clearly to the patients. The, the patients don't all have the same symptoms. And you need to look at each patient and what their symptoms are and try to come up with your own strategy that may help treat that. There's a lot of drugs out there that can modulate these things. 
Um, and I hope that that will work. Um, I think it's a really important point. So I think we can treat us for symptoms, and this includes helping with pain them for those who are in pain, helping with sleep them for those who um, have sleep dysfunction, and also evaluating um, every patient for orthostatic intolerance, which is a very common symptom in this condition. And I, you know, I, I just found the drug that works for orthostatic intolerance. My heart rate is normal. I used to go up to, to like 140 every time I would stand up. It's normal for the first time in seven years. It should not have taken a long to find that drug. Um, there are drugs for cough that are very, very commonly prescribed, and so and it's and, and there are easy ways to sort of evaluate what your patient might have POTS in, in the office. So I encourage everyone for patients with these symptoms to learn what those kind of uh, those methods are and to evaluate your patients. What was the drug? Um, Florinef, um, so fluidocortisone. Um, I also just found out that I, I have a pituitary issue that was very obvious when I arrived in 2012, um, and it was only because I put it in a film that got broadcast on national television that I don't know if the and saw it, and was able to diagnose it properly. And so, but there are a number of drugs for POTS. Um, they're very easy to find with removal POTS management, um, and different ones work for different patients because our the same symptoms have uh, probably slightly different causes in each person. So it's a bit of trial and error. Um, so fluidocortisone and also um, mesomon are both very helpful for me, um, as well as antivirals. Um, and, and you know that's like what's controversial. You probably go to medical school, you have kind of tighter, it doesn't even you actually really have the the um, uh, the the uh, uh, sorry active virus. Um, but we get shingles at higher rates. We get I was getting an HSV one after I got my lipo went from once every three years to like three times a year to every month to twice a month. And every time we did, I had neurological symptoms. I know patients get shingles monthly. And so when you see that happening in someone, you, know, you don't have to believe that they have reactivated virus. That's for those people you can see it, right? And so it's, sort of, it's really about trying to piece out what is happening in this patient. And for the things that I can see, and the things that I can see, what can I do specifically for this person to help them? Um, and so, and, and I also think, and it's also in the handout, there are a lot of comorbidities, um, like ehlers danlos Syndrome, um, um, uh, like uh, 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 IBD that people people can be treated for as well. So it's really about looking at each patient, what their case is, and trying to pull out what can help. And my experience with this, I would without my drugs, I would not be here. I would I don't think I would be alive to be frank. Um, but it took time to find that right kind of combination of things. And and everyone's going to be different, but I think there are things you can pull off. And and help begets help. Every time I found something that increased my functioning even just 5%. It made such a huge difference to me personally, and also actually helped everything work a little bit better. So I think, you know, it, it's gonna be bespoke until we have that master switch, right? And we have a deeper understanding, but I want, I, guess I want everyone to today understanding that there are actually things that you can do for your patients um, while we're waiting for the research. So, thank you. Uh, next, I, I want to introduce uh, Lisa Hall. Uh, Lisa is a healthcare professional who has worked with ME patients for 17 years, yeah. and uh, she's the head nurse at Northampton Integrated Medicine. That's one of Massachusetts' largest clinics serving patients uh, with chronic illnesses such as ME, and Lisa facilitates and coordinates their for patients. Uh, so, from a healthcare provider's perspective, um, can you describe what sort of approach you take when dealing with ME and how and how folks that you talk about all this trial of trying to find what will help with the symptoms and it's different for every patient. It sounds a little overwhelming. Now, what, what's it like for you? Well, I think that uh, what you're saying is just exactly what we do at the clinic. We are trying to look in a holistic way at what's going on with the patient. So we're definitely going to be looking at fatigue issues, you know, nutritional issues, B vitamin issues, uh, thyroid issues. These are all just medicine, you know, and so you can look at all those things. You can try to do those things. Um, looking at the viral infections, we've got good blood tests that show you what's going on, um, and then you treat it. Um, and the things like helping with sleep, um, you know, does this person have an insomnia problem? Do they have uh, sleep apnea? You know, these are all things that it's a tweak and a tweak and a tweak. You're not really addressing the whole MECFS, but you're helping the patient's quality of care. 
of life, and you're, and you're able to give them some improvement, which at least is encouraging. One of the issues that we have found over and over is even when we're doing this, even when we are looking in this very holistic way and really trying this and trying that and trying the other thing, some therapies will be very helpful, uh, some are not. Some work for one patient, they're just no use at all for the next patient. And sometimes they work for a while and then they stop working and we don't know why. Um, so you just kind of have to keep, you know, unpeeling the layers of the onion and just kind of keep on looking for how you can help. The other way that we can help as medical professions, professionals is by verifying the fact that this is a real illness, that these people are genuinely sick, and maybe they need a letter to their employer that says, you know, if they can't make it to work in the mornings, let them work from home. You know, let them work their own hours. Um, if they, you know, maybe they need a letter from <coughs> a disability company to convince them that yes, they went out of work on short-term disability and they should get paid for it because they're really sick. Um, and so we can advocate for our patients in that way. Too. Uh, how many patients would you say that you that you deal with or the clinic deals with that um, have any? Oh gosh, I, it's really hard to say because we work with a great variety of chronic illness. We work in all, with all the chronic illnesses in this kind of a holistic way. Um, I'm sure there are hundreds. And one of the things that is certainly true is that many of our patients, as you were saying, they disappear. You know, we'll see them on a good day. We may not see them again for six months or a year or two years because they're just too sick. They can't come in. They make an appointment. They try to come in. We do work with uh, phone consults as much as we can. You know, it's not always good medicine to, to work with someone with the phone, but if they can't get to the office and they need to consult with you about what's going on now that wasn't before, then we do phone consults, which unfortunately are not covered by insurance but at least they can have the benefit of talking with the medical professional and then perhaps having lab work uh, done that they can do locally and getting on some treatment that may be helpful. And that was uh, going to be another question. Insurance. How, how does insurance deal with all of this? I mean, you know that insurance companies can be difficult um, in, in any illness. Is it difficult when you have, uh, in some people's minds, a question about is this real? Well, I think the disability companies are the ones that are just impossible. Um, they really want to see something that's very concrete. They want to see that they have, you know, difficulty with range of motion or, you know, that there's a specific joint that is in pain. And when you don't have necessarily that kind of symptomatology, you know, how do you convince them this is a real illness? They actually have the midst of this with a had to take off time from work. And her insurance company, we wrote to them. We wrote to them that um, she was sleeping, she was in bed 14 hours a day. She woke up unrefreshed. She could be up for an hour or two, and then she had to take a nap for several hours. And we went on through her whole day describing it in detail, what she was capable of doing. And they came back and they said, well, she doesn't have any specific symptoms, does she? Okay, so this is a problem. However, conventional insurance, as far as health insurance, has not been a problem for us in terms of billing our uh, office visits, in terms of paying for uh, testing or prescription treatment. So we haven't had that problem. Uh, and next, I'd like to introduce our, our last panelist, and we'll open it up for, for your questions uh, soon. Uh, Faith. Uh, is Professor of Education at Delaware State University. Uh, she also serves as Chairperson of the CFS Advisory Committee for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And she's a middle school principal and assistant superintendent and parent of a child uh, with MECFS. Is that right? That is correct. I got, I got all of it. Uh, and your focus, uh, Dr. Newton, is on educating students. Uh, your work is used by the CDC, and also you have a, a primer ME CFS diagnosis and management in young people. Correct, and one of the um, authors of the education chapter. Uh, 
my, I have twins. My son has MACFS, my daughter does not. So very unusual. The twins are now 22. Um, Michael got sick when he was about 10 or 11 and was very sick. And like Jen said, um, it's a spectrum disease. We played the game of what did he have and how sick was he and how many meds were we going to try to see what was going on. We were very lucky in that there were other children in our area that also had MECFS. And there was never a question. I was an assistant superintendent at the time, so there was never a question of what is wrong with this child. It, was he really sick? It was what are we going to do about it? Um, my specialty, my background was education, and I went into higher ed, and I just moved into how do we help children with MECFS? What kind of accommodations can we do for them? How do we help them in the classroom? Um, what kind? What do we do when they're homebound and they can't go to school? My son never went back to school full time. He went to school part time his entire middle school years. Actually, he didn't. I don't think middle school he was in school more than two hours a day. Some months he didn't go at all. Um, he is in college full time. We found a college that was able to accommodate him. Um, he is MECFS is by far the worst in the morning. Um, but he will graduate with his sister and and will do fine. He moder he. Uh, does well with the disease. But I've done a lot of work with um, how do we get our students the accommodations that they need in the classroom? What do we do if they're homebound and they can't go to school? Why is it important for them just to go in, just to have lunch? All right, so they're only in school for an hour every other week. Oh well, okay, they need that socialization. What, what can we do to help them? Because they are really sick. And it is an invisible disease. And it looks very different. We have children in the same school that have MECFS, yet one child, one child's symptoms is completely different than another child's symptoms. And like Jen said, the effort just to get on that bus or to go to school for an hour, you do not see what happens at home. You have no idea what the effort it takes for that child just to go to school, whether they're 11, whether they're 16, whether they're 18. So how do we get them through middle school? How do we get them through high school? How do we get them to graduate? And we have smart children. Because of the cognitive difficulties, does that mean we put them in special education classes? No. What do we do with them? How do we teach them? What kind of services do we provide them? And so I do that kind of advocacy work. Um, and hopefully we're making a difference in getting those accommodations and those modifications for students across states in the U.S. We have, um, we have a lot of school nurses in the audience tonight, I'm told. So what would your advice be to school nurses uh, who may be questioning whether this is an issue with a particular student or, or how to deal with it? My first advice would be to listen to what their symptoms are. If they, if they're on ECFS, if they are worse in the morning, then they don't come to school in the afternoon. They can only handle two hours every three weeks. They can only handle two hours every three weeks. Probably the biggest issue is their loss of friends. You know, there, my son did not have somebody come over the house for probably five years. He was that sick. So if they can only get to school, and they can only get to school for an hour, they only get to school for an hour. I mean, he, <coughs> He was homebound, tutored in some of his classes the entire seven years. Um, sometimes he went to school just for lunch. Sometimes he went to school just to go to computer class because his specialty was he's actually going to graduate with a coding degree for computer science and math. Um, you have to look at the symptoms and you have to figure out what they can handle. You also have to believe the child. If the child says that they cannot go to class, they cannot go to class. If the child says they cannot take the test because they can't think, they cannot think. I think the biggest thing that's so hard for our kids that are sick is that they forget simple things. They forget how to multiply three by five. They get so upset. They forget how to spell simple words. Yet they can do a complex math problem if they're in high school. And that's so heartbreaking for them. Their friends don't come over anymore. So how do we handle them? What do we do with them at school? And how do we make those accommodations and get them still to live and to function and not lose their friends and to graduate from high school? And that's the biggest thing. What would you say schools right now, what would the best be to, to schools? What do you think they're doing wrong right now and that they need to know? Maybe they had 
better awareness, they might be able to do it differently. The problem is many of our schools don't know how to accommodate children who have an invisible illness. They simply don't see it. A child walks in and looks like Jen, sits down. Do you think there's anything wrong looking at her? And so they don't understand what they say to Michael or whoever, you know, what do you mean you don't remember what you did five minutes ago? They're asked to do a task. They can't multitask. They don't remember what happened 20 minutes ago. And the teacher gets frustrated. And the teacher doesn't understand that they don't have the capability to do that. And so it's very difficult because the teacher does not understand the illness. So I would say to school nurses, please make sure your faculty understands what this child is going through, what is wrong with them, and what they are actually seeing with that child in the classroom. You know, they have cognitive difficulties. They have just the mental stress of taking a test is probably going to cause a crash. You know, you're not going to see what happens when they get home or when they get in the classroom. And that's the hardest thing for, for teachers to see. And having been an educator, and I am an educator, I understand you've got 30 kids in the classroom, and you have this one child that just sits there. Thank you. Uh, now, now that we sort of know everybody on the panel a little bit, I want to make sure we have some time for questions from you. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. I think we have a microphone uh, floating around in the audience, or I can repeat your question. So the question is, at what age would a child be diagnosed, and who would do the type of diagnosis? If your pediatrician is knowledgeable, your pediatrician can diagnose them. All right, and then your pediatrician can either work with a specialist or send them to a specialist. Um, Michael was diagnosed at 11. All right, so that's how young. I know kids that have been diagnosed as young as second and third grade. Do you know that number? No, I think that's about as young as we've seen. So the question is, what type of physical measurement might there be to, to help with the diagnosis? And then who are the specialists? Um, so there really isn't a definitive Test that can be done. This is why we need to have the research so we can get the marker he's talking about. Um, and really just have to test all the things that make sense to test. Um, for instance, yeah, you've got to test their heart rate. Yeah, you know, if they're complaining of some trouble with sleep, maybe you want to order a sleep study. Um, and if you think that they might have a viral infection, you could do a panel of, you know, Epstein-Barr virus and uh, herpes virus and HHV6 and cytomegalovirus. virus. Uh, mycoplasma pneumoniae, chlamydia pneumoniae are, are good candidates. Um, uh, and you have to look at do they have some kind of tick-borne illness because that could be part of the picture, not the whole thing, but part of the picture. So, you know, you really have to, you have to go, you have to dig a little. So is it a diagnosis of exclusion in yeah. such, or is it just all those pieces go together? Sorry, I'm going to go ahead. Oh, yeah. um, so it, it's not. It has been for a long time, um, but the Institute of Medicine, we had two years ago, came up with a diagnostic criteria that are wrong and that you have. And so we can now affirmably diagnose the disease based on the symptoms. And I think the thing that is probably um, you know, cognitive function, this function I think we understand and it is a sort of, I can't add three, three times three. And it's actually really interesting that you say that because I, I've had an experience of being able to do fairly complex things and then not being able to do simple things and, or being able to do, you know, hard things but not in an order. So like, like the, 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 the deficits can be kind of specific and have to sort of ask questions that are always about, in, in, in reference to, well, what did you used to do? Or what do you do on good days and bad days? I think the, the, the other thing um, to mention is we propose a social dilemmas piece, and I think that's the hardest thing to understand. But it's really is that kind of section in the film where Nancy Kleinus is talking about that, that kind of narrow space of the cognitive and the physical activity that we can do without going to anaerobic metabolism. And so I was, you know, when I was at my sickest, I would go, I would start creating lactic acid, like a runner running too, too hard, too long, by just getting up and walking to the kitchen. Um, and so what people, you know, what that red line is for people is gonna vary from patient to patient over the course of their illness and sometimes day to day. So I have, you know, one of the things many of us do is heart rate monitoring because it gives us a kind of rule of thumb 
about like what is today like. So you know, I would have days where my heart rate was over 100 when I woke up before I even got out of bed. My head and pillow would go 120. So those were days when I knew I should not get out of bed today. And so I think I think that. Um, uh, and, and one thing I really think is important to mention with that is, is the importance of pacing, right? So it's about, you know, there's this idea with this illness for a long time that if they just exercise, they'll feel better. The reality is most of us, you know, if we were physically active, we could go from being physically active to being down, which means very, often very, very quickly. And so I was having this conversation with the doctors where they were like, well, why don't you just go out, you know, and exercise more? And I'm like, well, I was skiing last week, and now I can't move my head, right? I'm not deconditioned, like something else is going on here. And so I, you know, and on the on the topic of pacing and accommodations, um, I was a mild case my first year. My my problem, and I wasn't diagnosed, but my problem after my fever was that I would go skiing with my family on the weekend in Vermont, and then would be on the you know on the slopes for four hours, and suddenly my legs would feel like jelly. I'd go lie down, I'd be down the entire weekend on a couch and not know why, or I would go for you know, 12 mile bike ride usually, and I would make it to mile six, and I would, I would just, I just hit a wall, and I wouldn't know why. I would give anything if that was my level of disability today, but I kept pushing against that red line, not realizing I was doing it because I didn't have a diagnosis, and I didn't have proper management. And I think one of the things that we can all do for patients, whether we're, you know, a physician or a school nurse, is to sort of. Um, just help get the message out there about the importance of respecting those boundaries and learning what it is to live within. 80 to 60 percent of that boundary. Um, we don't know this for sure, but anecdotally, anecdotally um, patients who, who push themselves too hard um, and patient, you know, have a much worse outcome than those who are able to, to pace. And actually, it's, it's by pacing um, that you, that as I've seen, that you actually can maybe even start to try to expand that capacity of what you can do by doing less. Um, and you know, I really wish that my school. I was at Harvard at the time, and I was I was really dragging myself to class um, because I the kinds of accommodations that I needed, which were recorded lectures, so I didn't have I could, I could show up only for the test. I could try problems in without physically going and turning it turning it in. Um, they didn't do it because they were not set up to deal with ME, and they were not set up to deal with problems. And that's why accommodations are really important for participation. But also because when you force students to then just come out, just come out for a little while longer, it actually you actually actually harm them in ways that might be permanent. And so um, I hope that that's something that this amount of take take today. And um, last really quick story, I last night at a screening at, I met at Harvard at medical school at Harvard, I met this young woman who was, you know, spent a year in high school in bed in a dark room um, and was totally sick. Um, and you know, fortunately made a partial recovery, but she had to, her parents had to fight the school because they would not give her accommodations. They wanted to choose the AP classes, they wanted to pass her along um, in regular classes just to graduate her and push her out. And she was very lucky to have a family that fought very hard for her. And so she was able to go to the university that issued her, her, her needs. Um, and now she's a first year student at Harvard Medical School. And she's becoming a doctor, um, a doctor with a disability because she had the accommodations. And so it, it really, I think, you know, um, uh, I think it's a lesson in what people with this condition can um, accomplish if they have the proper diagnosis, the proper care, and the proper accommodations. I also want to comment on what she was saying about that pacing. You have to be really careful not to push too far because if you do, it, you just get sicker and sicker and sicker. Uh, somebody asked about um, where can you find symptoms in a diagnosis. The um, it's just been published, uh, the myalgic encephalitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, diagnosis and management in young people are primer is for clinicians, <coughs> all right? It is out there. Um, it, it, it should be on the website on the information that you've been handed out, but it's got anything and everything in there. It's been written by a number of um, clinicians across the world, um, and it's very, very well done. The other thing for pediatric patients, the CDC website is also excellent for pediatric patients. And I would highly recommend it if you're looking for information on um, MECFS for pediatric patients. But the primer is also excellent. There's both an adult one and a new young people primer that just came out last September. It's published in Frontiers and Pediatrics. So what do we know about the initial use of antivirals at the onset of symptoms? I don't know if you know the answer to that, if we know the answer to that question, because typically it takes at least six months to diagnose any CFS. 
Now, my son's been on antivirals now for 10 years. He couldn't live without them. There's, he just, he misses two days and he's done. Um, that's how important they are to his life. And he's also on um, the POTS meds as well. There's just simply no way he could be without those meds. When you first get sick, you first get that viral infection, which I've done in the same sense is so characteristic of NECFS. You don't know you've got NECFS. You just have a virus. And you know, you go to your doctor, your doctor's not going to slap you on an antiviral right off the bat. It's not until later. There have been some studies that have been very powerful about antivirals. For some patients, it's tremendous. Other patients make no difference. So it's I wish there was the magic bullet, but that's why we need more research. Well, I'm so sorry because I do have to, have to go. Um, but please find out if you'd love to engage you um, as we move forward with your work. Um, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank our panel very much, and uh, thank Rivka as well. She has a few remarks before before we leave. And thank all of you for coming. Again, there there is information uh, for you to read and information available so you can learn more. So thank you, Rivka. Uh, personal note: um, 20 years is an awful long time to have to have waited for this event. But I am so deeply, deeply moved and thrilled that each of you have, has come. Uh, so please tell your friends and colleagues how serious this disease is, that we need your help to improve our lives and the lives of one to two and a half million Americans. That's 17 to 20 million uh, around the globe. And, uh, and that is Janet Defoe, Ron Davis's wife, who is also a wonderful Emmy advocate for yeah. Janet, Janet, but you're getting a round of applause. Um, they're taking care of their very, very, very ill son. Thank you all so much for coming. Please get in touch if we can help you in any way with MECFS.